So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Tomislav Zivkovic from the Institute Roger Boskovic in Zagreb. And he's going to, to enlarge the, the, the problems we have been discussing un, to, until now to the quantum field. So I uh, hope there will be a lot of interventions and, uh, and, and discussions. So please, uh, Tomislav, could you start your lecture? OK. Thank you very much, Franco. Well, I'm going now to talk about some, uh, so to say, ideas of space and time. In fact, I would like to stress what is my point here. My point is that the space-time uh, conception should be entirely based on quantum theory, and that today's ideas of space-time are based on classical theory. Uh, first, I would like to start with some problems with the classical notion of space-time as illustration of those problems. I have those three experiments. One is uh, the f uh, famous Einstein-Podolsky-Rosen experiment, Gedanken experiment, <coughs> concerning spooky action at distance in 1935. Another is mach zender interferometer experiments, uh, uh, which uh, the question is which way did photon go, either one side or another, which experiment was performed in 2006. And another is Stern-Gerlach experiment uh, also, which was also quite recently performed this experiment. Now let me start with, uh, with uh, uh, okay, uh, with this uh, uh, pair Gedanken experiment. As you know, Einstein was very much, uh, uh, not very much enthusiastic about quantum theory, and he uh, raised uh, many objections to quantum theory. All objections were put down in his conversation with Bohr. That was his last objection in 35, in the year 35, where the, he made one so-called Gendanken experiment. And uh, the point was that you have one uh, 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 positronium which annihilates in the middle, in the middle of uh, uh, this, uh, uh, excuse me, I have to end out. OK. Ah, here, I have here. Uh, which annihilates uh, uh, to two photons here, one left, one right, and those photons are correlated. And in fact, you can, by this uh, a pair experiment, by uh, examining the properties of this photon, you can deduce the properties <coughs> of this photon, which was so-called spooky action at a distance. And uh, that is really this uh, einstein podolsky rose experiment of the properties of particle I, I can have no influence on particle B. That was uh, their, uh, their uh, argument, that if you measure here, you cannot any, by no way influence the properties of particle B, which means that quantum theory should be incomplete, because it does not predict some properties which you have. So particle B must have those properties before the measurement. However, quantum theory does not predict this. Well, the answer of the proponents of quantum theory was a little bit nasty. I would say was not very, very nice. And uh, okay, oh, oh, excuse me. I did. Uh, uh, so that conclusion is for concluding remarks of their paper is that while we have just shown that the wave function does not provide a complete description of the physical reality, we left open the question whether or not such a description exists. We believe, however, that such a theory is possible. That is the last sentence in their paper. And now, what was the answer of the proponents of quantum theory? Uh, uh, well, let me uh, reassume again key Einstein argument, what he was, is one is assumption we should, in my opinion, absolutely retain. Real situation in system uh, S2, that is another system, is independent on what one does with the system S1, which is left, which is separated from the first system. His argument was really locality. What you do on the, si on the system one can in no way influence of the system two, which is far enough and where the signal cannot uh, come even if it travels with the speed of light. That is really the argument of, of locality. You must a strict locality. That was really Einstein's key point in that argument concerning this experiment. 
Uh, and of course, he then, uh, at that time, nobody really did see that quantum theory predicts such action at a distance. Einstein was really one of the rare persons who was smart enough to see that quantum theory predicts so-called spooky action at distance, or spookhaften Fernwirkungen, as, as he said it. And of course, he said that is impossible. The physics could not possibly behave like that. We'll see later, in fact, Einstein was wrong on that because experiments later show that there exists spooky action at distance, but at that time, no physicists did see any problem with that. Because what they said, they said, well, there is no problem with that. Like Wolfgang Pauli said, one should not break his head about something of which we can know nothing, no more than about the old question, how many angels can sit on top of the, uh, of the pin. In fact, his argument was, that is only, so to say, artificial problem, because in no way we can really uh, translate it into some uh, efficient effect from here to here. It is just in our head, some theoretical, so to say, explanation, and we should not break the head about that because it doesn't matter. We should not discuss something which we cannot measure. Well, that was done in the year 35. However, about 30 years later, uh, John Stuart Bell uh, translated this basic idea, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, in the question which can be answered by concrete experimental measurement. He did show that there are predictions of quantum theory about correlation of those two measurements, which in no way can be explained by local classical theory. In no way can be explained. And now the question was, of course, whether those predictions are true or not. John Stuart Bell believed that that quantum theory is going to break at that point, that when the real experiments will be performed, it will be shown that it does not work, that quantum theory is wrong. And uh, uh, he, quantum, uh, he uh, really produced so-called Bell inequalities, which should be uh, experimentally verified whether they are true or not. At that time, experimental was, experiment was not uh, good enough in order to uh, verify that. It needed another 20 years to come to the real experiment to see what is there. And that real experiment was in 1982. You see how, how many years came from the first paper, 1935 to 1982 where really it was experimentally done. The Allen aspect, that guy, experimentally verified those inequalities and showed that quantum predictions are confirmed. That is, there is spooky action at distance. Spooky action at distance confirmed. It. That was in the year 82. Now that was experimentally done in one laboratory. That is his experiment how it was that it was uh, 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 two electron states of calcium atom. They were erased from the ground state to this. And now at that point, it comes down by successive emission of two photons. There is one photon, there is another photon. Those are just wavelengths of the photon that is in the green light, that is in the blue light. And uh, those photons go, one comes one way, another another way. If really, if you so to say, touch this photon, this one feels it, it responds. You have spooky action at distance. They behave as if there is one and the same system. And how it was done in the laboratory, that is this uh, laboratory where the test was done in the year 82. And uh, photons were detected within the interval of 20 nanoseconds, that is said to the minus nine seconds, very fast. And intermediate state, as I showed you, that comes one photon, and after that comes another. And that is intermediate state, which lasts only for five nine sec nine, nine, uh, nanoseconds. So that state in between is very short. And distance between those detectors have been 13 meters. And light needs 40 nanoseconds for 13 meters. You see, photons detected within 20 nanoseconds. So twice as short as light needs to come 
from one experimental point to another to have any explanation of that that was by the speed of light some influence on that. So that proved experimentally spooky action at distance, experimentally confirmed with the speed bigger than the speed of light, at least twice as big. Well now, that experiment was succeeded by many other experiments, uh, which I show you just one, because the people believed, okay, that may be in the distance of 10 meters or so on, but now this guy performed the same experiment at distance of more than 10 kilometers, with the same result. The two photons which came 10 kilometers apart, if you touch this one, they still immediately that effect. Nicola Gissing, that was in the, in the year 1997, that experiment performed it, and this is how it was in Switzerland performed. Here, the two photons, those are optical cables, left and right. In one optical cable is going one photon left, here's a, a measuring instrument. Another optical cable photon going down, here measuring instrument. If you touch this one, this one feels. Distance 10 kilometer, and that experiment, they did really show experimentally, so to say, that that, is, that effect is going at least 10,000 times as the speed of light. It depends on your reference frame. In fact, they took as a reference frame the reference frame of, of uh, 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 so to say, uh, uh, moving stars reference frame of, uh, uh, of uh, background, background radiation. That's right, yes, so background radiation. And with respect to that reference frame, that was at least 10 thousand times as the speed of light, that effect here. Well, that is the belly over 10 kilometer, that was the source, and that was, here is, was one detector, here was another detector, distance 10 kilometer, and the effect did not die off with a distance. That effect was completely different from anything we know in physics, because in physics we know if the distance is bigger, the force is smaller, the attraction is weaker, and so on. <coughs> it depends on the distance. This effect does not depend on the distance. Now, how does nature perform the trick? That Nikola Gissin, he goal, uh, got a Bell Prize in 2009 because of that experiment and so on. And during the lecture he said, that was from his speech, I consider this one of the most important questions central to the, to uh, to the today's physics. How does nature perform the trick? How is it possible that when I touch here, here immediately it feels? It is in contradiction with everything we know from classical physics. But quantum physics predicted and that is really what Einstein was smart enough to see. No physicist at that time did see that prediction of quantum physics. Einstein thought that that prediction is so absurd that it must be wrong. And he said, well, that is going to show that quantum physics is not complete. In fact, he was wrong in that. Quantum physics was right here, what he did not, he did not believe. That. Well, now I go to another experiment of that time of non-locality, it is experimental Mach Zender interferometer. Which way did photon go? That is that experiment. You have here one source of photons, which you go, photons are going here one by one, and here at that you have half silver, half silver mirror, and they are reflected. And now let me just show you by slowly the argument. You have here, so to solve, half silver mir mirror or beam splitter with the probability 50% that the photon is reflected and 50% it is going on. You have here two detectors, D1 and D2 detector. And now if you put the detectors like that, as I showed you, if you detect here a photon, what are you going to say? You are going to conclude, okay, photon did go this way, reflected and came here. It did not go this way. Now, if you detect it here, you would go, photon did go this way, it did not go this way. 
But quantum mechanics tells you that it did go both ways because if you solve a Schrodinger equation, wave function is going to be different from zero here and here. That is what quantum theory tells you. But your logic, so to say, tells you, well, it's impossible. I detected it here, it must be going here. I detected it must be going here. But let us now a little bit complicate this uh, experiment to put some other twist on it. And let us go here, uh, one reflector here, here, and now detectors D1 and D2. In this case, again, if I detect the photon here, then my explanation is normal explanation. The photon came here, reflected here, and reflected here. If I get it here, my explanation is it went here, it went here. So the photon either detected here or here, I know it did weigh one of those two possible ways, which are classical possible ways. But now you, I put another twist to the experiment, and I put a big slitter here. What now comes out by the result of experiment? It comes out the result that only this detector takes the photon and this one does not register any photon. How come? If it did go this way or this way when it comes here, it has probability 50% to be reflected, probability 50% to come. It must then, in each second, approximately go here or here, but it does not. But if I use strictly quantum theory, then I have only explanation that photon did go simultaneously both ways, and then the wave function it comes here, it comes here to constructive interference that mathematics says. In this direction, destructive in this direction, I don't go here. So the only way to explain it is to follow the letter of quantum theory, which says photon did go both ways simultaneously. Point that our mind is set up that we think it must be going one or other way. It is we think. It is so bad for us. But quantum theory says it must be here, and that is what happens. We can now, this experiment, a little bit elaborate and put here one thing which will change the, so to say, optical phase of the photon. Phase shift. And with this phase shift, we can slowly change a phase shift so that those two branches of the same photon, when they come here, they are either in phase to go here or here, so when I increase that, slowly that probability is going to change according to quantum theory. As much as I change this phase shift, so photon is in the state of the superposition, it is at the same time at both possible phases. And if this experiment is done, the result is here up. Here is the phase shift, that means how ZIC is my instrument of the phase shift. Here is the probability of photons being detected on the right detector, this red, and here is on the left detectors, and those are the numbers of photons you see detected, 2,200, because you de detect them one by one. The sum of them is the same, but you see as you change the phase shift, on the beginning, all our photons are at the detector, right detector, and none here. That is what I showed you on the beginning. But now, when you extend the phase shift, that probability here is slowly to come down. This is to raise, so as to make the sum again 1,200, how many photons you have, and that is going to be in complete agreement with quantum theory, and the clip, uh, complete agreement to his picture that photon did go both ways simultaneously. Point. But, but this can be much easier to explain by simple electromagnetic theory. Right? No. Like no, 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 no. Because when you explain by electromagnetic main, you, you don't assume that photons are particles. You, 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 are, uh, doing, you are doing an error which was really in the conversation because Einstein and Planck because, or not Planck, Einstein and Bohr, where Bohr did not admit the, the, uh, the uh, particle property of photon until the year 1926, when he finally admitted when the experiment did show yeah. that. And we the light beam, it's, it's done. No, no, no. That is classical explanation which is wrong. Okay. 
if you if you if you if you uh, <laughs> turn off the beam splitter, that is the result of experiment. Your beautiful experiment with base theory relates to magnetism. No, no. <laughs> Well, well, when Max Planck <laughs> did write the read write recommendation for yeah. Albert Einstein, let me just yeah. say, in 1912, to be elected as a, a professor at the Berlin, uh, at the, uh, Berlin University, he did write in this explanation that Einstein is very good scientist and so on and so on. He suggested that Einstein be given double salary as a professor. He suggested also that Einstein should not be obliged to have lectures to have students. And Einstein added one more um, request. He said, I, I should not reassume German citizenship because he was citizen of, of Swiss. And that was all agreed upon. But in that letter of recommendation, there was also one sentence. One should forgive Albert Einstein to have some mistaken <coughs> things such as his idea of particle-like properties of photon. Because in such a uh, scientifically loaded area, one can usually make some mistakes. So he thought like you think here, so you are forgiven, okay. No, no oh. this. That's yes, policy, and those are this. Oh, okay, I, I, I give up. No, but may, maybe you can present this in your talk. Uh, no, no, I'm not going to. No, uh, Danko sita quises philosophus manzises. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, now that is this zinc. And that was experimentally realized by Wheeler in 2006, so it is quite a recent experiment when that was all completely that, that done. Okay. So now I go to the ZERN experiment, and that is Stern-Gerlach experiment, where you have, for example, a particle which has uh, spin one, and in Stern-Gerlach apparatus, it can go uh, projection of spin one, zero, or minus one, which are those possibilities. And now the question is also, which way did particle go? That is Spengerl experiment. You have here in homogeneous magnetic field. I, I, I am not uh, going into uh, details how, how, how uh, it works. Uh, but uh, that is here you have incoming particle in some state C. And it has classic, like we would say, it splits into two, three, three branches. Now, if you put here, uh, if you put here um, uh, apparatus to register a particle, you will obtain it either here or here or here. Now, if you get your, uh, your uh, instrument registers a particle here, you would say, usually the people say, okay, the particle did go this way. If you register it here, the particle did go this way. And if you register it here, the particle did go this way. That is how is usual, so to say, explanation. But quantum theory tells us that the particle did go all three ways sim simultaneously. That is what quantum theory tells us. So usually one has an argument. The stern gerlach apparatus separates each particle to go, in the above case, along one of the three possible paths. This is not, the particle is going along all three paths at the same time. How we can know it? We can know it by combining this instrument with stern gerlach instrument, which is side by side, which is opposite direction of that stern gerlach experiment, and which gives you this. So that is one instrument, that is a second instrument, which puts the, the, those uh, parts together. And now, what we get by experiments, what we get here? Here, if we, that was the really so, that the particle went this way, that state must be in the state spin one. If it went this way, that state must be in the spa state spin zero. And it came here, it must be in the state minus one. 
But I can prepare this state here, see, <coughs> in a mixture, in linear combination of those two states. And I uh, experimentally get here exactly a linear combination. You cannot get a linear combination here if it were the particle length here, here, because you, uh, you must get either one of those discrete possibilities. You cannot get linear combination experimentally. And you obtain linear combination. And the only way how to explain is that the particles simultaneously went by all three ways. And that is what quantum theory tells you. The reduction of the wave uh, packet happened here at the instrument. Before that, no reduction happened. Nothing happened. So if the particle did go only along one path, in this case, on the end of the loop, this, this particle would have spin either one of the, like this one, and not this state, with identical spin as the entry state. Well, you can prepare this state in any combination with any possible constants A, B, and C, how just to, must be to normalize this state, any combination, and the same one you get at the outlet, at the result. Okay, so above three examples, which I showed you, demonstrate that classical notion of space and time requires a radical change. Because when we follow classical notion of space, the particle must go one way or another way and another way. We are bound to do that. The particle can be at the same time at several different places. That is what those experiments really tell us if we interpret them as you should interpret them, and not to use classical ideas. The no, uh, uh, the, uh, the notion of a point in space and the particle trajectory in space is hence obsolete because the particle has no trajectory. It is at the same time at two different points in space. The same must apply to the notion of moment in time, which is mathematically a point in the time axis and to the entire space time because of Lorentz transformations. Because if you have such property, non-locality of space, you must have non-locality in time. Otherwise, the Lorentz transformation does not work. Can quantum theory provide an adequate description of space and time along those points? Well, quantum theory, in fact, so-called orthodox interpretation was at the Solvay Congress 1927. Those are members of the Solvay Congress, most important members, only one lady, as you <coughs> see here, you know, of course, who it, it, it <coughs> is. That is Max Planck, Albert Einstein, Louis de Broglie, Heidelberg, Niels Bohr, Emil Schrödinger, and that is where so-called uh, this uh, orthodox interpretation of quantum theory was created, in a sense. And how we describe, to start with, a physical state in a classical and in quantum picture. We really describe it in very two different ways. In classical picture, one particle state, I just go on one particle because it is simple, at time t is situated at the point x. It is x equal x from t. That is classical picture, and that is one line in space. In quantum picture, a, a, a one particle state at time t is situated in the state c. That is wave function, that is not on the point. That wave function is a point in the Hilbert space of states, not in our three-dimensional space. That is there. In fact, in the generalized Hilbert space, which was created by Bogolyubov, but I don't go into, into those details. Because Hilbert space is denumerable space. Mm -hmm. It means it is infinite dimensional, but with, with uh, uh, the number of the dimension is as the numbers of uh, integers. In it, it is not continuous as the number of, of C, which you must extend the Hilbert space in order to allow for functions such as plane wave, because plane wave is not the member in the Hilbert space, because you cannot normalize it. All the states in Hilbert space you should be normalized, and plane wave is not. So sloppily we usually use it. And also a delta function, the point is also not normalized, but it's not also not a member of Hilbert space. So you must add it mathematically to complete it. But this is just a mathematical no. story. So the state C is not at one point in a three-dimensional space H3. This state is at the, at the point in an infinite-dimensional space, Hilbert space. 
or in fact generalized Hilbert space. So what we have is the notion of a physical state in quantum theory is radically different from the notion of the physical state in classical theory. In the classical theory, the state of a particle is the position of this particle in space. Hence, the point in the space has such an absolute meaning because that is how is built up the classical theory. In quantum theory, position of a particle is replaced with the wave function. Hence, the wave function assumes the role of the position of the particle. We must think of the position of the particle that psi is position, not x. X is in classical physics. Psi is position of the particle in quantum theory. And now, classical space, how it is uh, just shortly uh, constructed. Euclidean group of, uh, set of uh, all linear transformations of three-dimensional real space that causes distance. That is this distance between two points. And that distance is in all rotations, translations concerned. Okay. That is so-called group O3, this orthogonal three-dimensional group, rotations, uh, uh, which includes rotations and reflections. Now, this uh, T3, uh, uh, th that is this group, those are group of rotation, and that, are, that is group of translations, three-dimensional translations. Now, uh, okay, here we have also one now additional thing how the space is classical space constructed. The problem is that we must exclude reflections from that because that is where we are reduced to so-called special Euclidean group, that is S means for special, O3, where the distance is conserved and in addition, no reflections are. So special Euclidean group is maximum connected subgroups of it. What does it mean maximum connected sub subgroup? That means in topological sense, each element of this group you can reach from the unit element, which means do nothing. That means in continuous, uh, you can do that. Reflection, you cannot uh, arrive at, at uh, continuous way. Reflection is that all uh, coordinate axis you replace by minus. So x minus x, y minus y, z minus. So left-oriented coordinate system you replace with right-oriented coordinate system. That is really reflection. And that cannot be arrived at in a continuous way. So why reflections are excluded? Why we don't include reflections? Well, those two guys are responsible for that, that we don't include the reflections, which got the Nobel Prize in 57. They experimentally did prove that the laws of physics, in particular weak interactions, are not invariant under space reflections. That means, and they got Nobel Prize, those two guys. Nice, nice guys. Th that was relatively, that was quite a big surprise that left and right are not equal. That left coordinate system, the laws in left are not the same as the physical laws in right. And that applies only to weak interactions, but it's sufficient because uh, 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 gravitational forces, strong interactions, electromagnetic interactions are all invariant under left and right. Only weak interactions are not, which, is, uh, which are responsible to, for example, beta radioactivity are weak interactions responsible for. Now comes a bit of mathematics that instead of this group, what I told you, SO3 special orthogonal translation, we have this group, which is universal covering group of this group. What does it mean? That means that this is the smallest group which contains this group and which is simply connected. What does it mean uh, uh, topologically simply connected? Simply connected means that each uh, continuous space which comes in it, you <coughs> can contract into one point. That means simply causality. If you have, for example, topology on the torus, imagine that as a torus. Then if you have something what is on the torus, it is not simply connected. Because if you have the line here, you cannot by any contraction contract it into one point. It is not simply connected. That is just topological, I mean, sense of simply connected. And this is the smallest simply connected group, which is bigger than that. And what is strange of it? 
it is really, you see, two, two. That means it is two-dimensional and U means unitary. So that group has complex numbers in it. This group has not. Those are all real numbers. And you have now one group which has complex numbers and which is two-dimensional, which is bigger than real group, which is three-dimensional in some sense. And now what you have, those are unitary two by two matrices, and this is just connection. And here comes another thing that in representation of this group, the main role is played by so-called Pauli matrices, those are two, two, two matrices, which are here, I'm not going into mathematical details, but you see that Pauli matrices, which were really found experimentally to be very important, concerning spin of electron and so on, are naturally building blocks of this simply commented group. So that group, which is in a sense mathematical artifact, somehow has connection to the physical reality. So you can say, well, is that group important or is that group important? Which group is really more, more important in physics? Well, now, each Hermitian two by two matrix of trace zero, that is what there is, represents a vector in three dimensional physical space. And this describes translation. IHU unitary group in a two dimensional defines a rotation in three dimensional space. So those two combined uh, define all that group. So that is universal covering group. So, but what do we find mathematically? We find one strange thing that to each element of this group, which we know, which is rotations and tra translations, correspond two elements of F sub one test three. So to each rotation in three-dimensional space correspond two actions in this two-dimensional complex space. What does it mean? Two elements in F sub one test three define the same rotation in a physical three-dimensional space. What does it mean? Is it any reasonable or not? Is it ju just an artifact? Well, now we can go to the connection with quantum theory to see which group is real group. Those two groups are both six parameter Lie groups, so-called Lie groups. Generators of those groups are in quantum theory three impulses. Those are those numbers, those are impulses, and those are angular momenta. But now in quantum theory, those are not numbers, those are operators. So operators are things which do not commute usually with each other. So A times B is not the same as B times A usually, sometimes it is. So that is what I said here in general, operators do not commute. So those two things which are mathematically, uh, uh, mathematically called generators of the group, somehow are connected to real physical property, to moments and to impulses. An arbitrary element in any group can be written in that way. Where this is rotation, you see that is here this operator, which is uh, uh, angular momenta, and this is translation. So that represents translation by A and rotation by omega. But what is strange? Strange is that this rotation, omega, both groups have the same structure, but this rotation for this group SO3 is limited that it must be mi minus than pi, and here absolute value minus than two pi. What does it mean? Here you have, when you have rotation in real space by two pi, your object comes to the same place, so you have the same object. But in this group, you must have, this covering group, you must have double as many, Rotation by four pi comes you to the same place. If you rotate only by two pi, you don't obtain the same thing. So how come? We know all normal things, if you rotate by two pi, it comes the same thing. How is it? Is it possible? Is it nonsense? Well, it turns out that you should listen to mathematics. It is not nonsense. Oh, that was a <coughs> point again. Is the group SO2, universal covering group of the group, only a mathematical artifact? What is the physical significance of the group? And I shall cite the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in natural science by Agent Paul Wigner, who said, uh, said that 
miracle of the appropriateness of the language of mathematics for the formulation of the laws of physics is a wonderful gift which we neither understand nor deserve. So you should follow my mathematics said that it should be respected. Now we see, let us see that physics also tells you that. Now I, uh, that is the same thing as I said, it's just repeat this rotation, not to lose the time, but just to come to the same that uh, I did not have the picture, but just I explain you that the stent gerlach experiment, you can find out the significance of the rotation of 4 pi. How? In stent gerlach experiment, you put one particle which has a spin one half, for example, like electron, it is going through inhomogeneous magnetic field. And it is going to inhomogeneous magnetic field. You can, with that magnetic field, you can really uh, put it that it is either pointing up or pointing down. Now you can also make such experiment that that particle comes at some sort, not as hard silver mirror, but at some place where that beam is split into two parts. So like I showed you with the photon, one part is up and one is down, and the particle is going simultaneously up and down, simultaneously there. And now after, <coughs> in that upper part, you have in homogeneous magnetic field, and you make the strength of that field such that you rotate the spin of the particles by two pi. So physically in our space you did nothing because it is at the same place. Now if you only register that on the screen, you will have all the same results. You will see, uh, uh, you will see no difference. This one is what was the initial explanation that that has uh, no physical consequences because the argument is that what you in quantum mechanics see is not the wave function psi, but the square of the wave function. If psi is changed to minus psi, the square is not changed. So it is no problem in that, because the square is not changed. But now, what you do, you have two parts, and here you change the sign to minus psi, and here you don't change, and now make the interfere then. And if you did not rotate the by two pi, they are going constructively to in interfere at one place. If you did rotate, constructive interference is going to be in another place. That means experimentally you did <coughs> prove, it is proven experimentally that rotation for two pi of quantum system has a physically measurable effect. And that is this Stern-Gerlach experiment which you did show you that thing. Now, I have now to come to this lady, Amalia Eminetter, which Einstein had very big esteem of her. And that is what is important here is this Netter's theorem, where he said that any differentiable symmetry of the action of a physical system has a corresponding conservation law. So what does it mean? It sounds very abstract, but it has very concrete consequences. The consequence is it that the Hamiltonian, which is the energy operator, is the infinitesimal generator of time. What does it mean? It means infinitesimal generator. It means when it acts on the state of the system, it pushes it in the time infinitesimally further. So that Hamiltonian really pushes the development of the system in time. And so, because of Netter's theorem, because Hamiltonian commutes obviously with itself, that means that energy is conservation. Why? Because Hamiltonian represents the energy. That is just the result of the, of the Netter's theorem. Now, Hamiltonian commutes also with the total impulses of the, system, of the system. And that means the total impulse of the system is, such uh, impulse conservation is consequence of Netter's theorem. And also that it commutes with angular momentum, and that means uh, th that conservation invariance with respect to the space rotation. So what we perceive invariance in space, invariance on translation of physics, on rotation and so on, from this point of view are consequences of Netter's theorem in quantum theory. Uh, okay, now that is a little bit uh, 
uh, in, in quantum theory where, where we have transforming state, all properties of the transforming system equal properties of the initial system only if this square is the same, and this square can be the same only if this operator is, can be mathematically shown unitary operator or the unitary operator that is just a mathematics there, uh, so that this operator must satisfy those commutation rules, which is really here shown. And what does it mean that it is Jupiter, uh, unitary? It means really that in the Hilbert space of state, I'm talking about the Hilbert space, it is rotation of the state. In our space, three dimension, it may look very differently, but in Hilbert space, unitary <coughs> operators mean only rotation, nothing else. Okay, and that is how that should be conserved. Let me just show. And uh, now, how classical space time can be produced from that is that if you consider the translations here, because that commutes with Hamiltonian, that means that it commutes also with this operator. And this operator, what it does when it acts on the wave function C, it just pushes it in the space. So that this operator in the Hilbert space, when changes wave function Psi to some other wave function that is here, what we see in our three-dimensional space, that that Psi is that initial state, and that Psi time is really what we interpret as a shifting for the amount R. That is how it's projected from the Hilbert space that effect to our space. Then we interpret it. So translation for a distance, say in a physical space, mathematically, action of the operator, this one, on the state C in the Hilbert space is rotation in the infinite dimensional Hilbert space. In the three-dimensional physical space, this rotation appears as a translation for the amount A. That is how we make connection of that to this physical. The same thing is for rotation. That operator in the Hilbert space, in our space, is seen as rotation. So rotation for the amount omega, mathematically action of the operator going on the state C is the rotation in the infinite dimensional Hilbert space. This rotation in Hilbert space in the three-dimensional physical space is rotation, our normal rotation, so to say. Now, that means that consequences of Netter theorem are that because of that commutes, this also commutes, where that is it. So since the impulse operator P commutes with Hamiltonian, it commutes also with each unitary operator root A. Physics is case invariant to the transformation, this one. This transformation is the rotation in Hilbert space of states, and it is perceived in a three-dimensional physical space as a translation. And also the same thing for the rotation, to say it. But now, uh, so consequences of Netter theorem are that because Hamiltonian commutes with unitary operator, those two states are really, one must interpret it as the same state looking in two different reference frames. In quantum theory, physics is invariant under unitary transformation U if this operator commutes with Hamiltonian. Now, unitary operators, that is now the main point which I want to point, which generate three-dimensional physical space are not the only unitary operators which commute with Hamiltonian. Because of all that logic which I said you, is that each unitary operator which commutes with Hamiltonian should be interpreted and it also should uh, uh, leave all physical laws the same. Because all the same reasons, you have no other reasons. So all such operators should be given an equal physical treatment. Now the question is, are those unitary operators, that is my claim, which uh, produce transformation in rotation are not the only unitary operators which commute with Hamiltonian. In fact, you have an infinite number of additional, additional operators which do that. And all of them should be given the same reason. So all unitary operators, which commute with Hamiltonian should be considered in order to construct the adequate notion of quantum space and time. Only in this way, a consistent quantum space-time structure can be obtained. Uh, there are some technical requirements of those operators, not all 
but I'm not going into those uh, because those mar must be uh, 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 continuous differable uh, functions and so on. Those are just technical requirements. Which operator can be considered in this way? But anyhow, that is infinitely many more operators that they are considered. So what is the structure of quantum space thus constructed in this way? Oh, here is what I consider the classical transformation. Transforming state C has the same shape as the initial state C. But now, if you look, some of those unitary operators, what is going to be? It is going to transform this state into this state. And in fact, into an all another completely different space and different reference uh, system where all loads are going to be the same that can be shown. So non-classical transformation, transforming state C has different shape and different localizability from the initial state. So in the transformed reference frame, this state has the same shape as the original state in the original reference frame. It must be, because that is just the principle of relativity. It has the same shape. It can be shown that in the state. Frame. For example, you have this here, which is all question that wave particle duality. That state can be transformed into that state. In our three-dimensional space, that is interpreted as particle. This is interpreted as wave. And in fact, the old question, what I, way, uh, what I want to emphasize, particle space duality, uh, particle wave duality, is artificial question. It depends on the reference frame, but in quantum s s uh, space, where you look at it. In one reference frame, it looks like that, in another like that. And then we interpret it as particle or as wave. So in one quantum reference frame, the state of the system is localized state, see? And it looks like particle in another is delocalized. The way particle duality in quantum theory is an artifact of the particular choice of a reference frame in which a system is considered. Now, that is just the particle. The state in one reference frame, the state is localized and it, is, uh, it looks like particle. The same state in another quantum reference frame, this state is delocalized, delocalized and it looks like a wave. So now in quantum space, all experiments which I showed you in the beginning, consider pre have a natural explanation. In our space, each of those experiments looks very strange and in contradiction with the space-time structure of a classical space-time. In quantum space, each of those experiments looks natural. In addition, in a quantum space, there is always a reference frame in which this experiment looks natural also from a point of view of classical space-time structure. It is like uh, as if you uh, would uh, look uh, the falling of a, of a stone on the Earth from the Jupiter. From the Jupiter point of view, that would be very complicated uh, path. But from the Earth's point of view, it would be just a straight line. Just depends on the reference frame where, where you look it, and all the problems really are that it is inadequate reference frame, in a sense which is taken to those quantum effects. So that in quantum space, there is a reference frame in which those two events, registration of two photons here and here, happen at the same space-time point, the same point in space at the same moment in time. There is no contradiction how it happens. Only in our reference frame, it looks like strange. Here also, in quantum space, there is a reference frame in which those two branches are one and the same branch. So the photons here and here are at the same point in time. No, those is only our reference frame is such that we see two branches which are going there. And here also the same thing. In quantum space, there is a reference frame in which those three branches are one and the same branch. So Einstein said that if quantum mechanics is correct, the world is crazy. Einstein was right, the world is crazy. Thank you. Thank you for this rather nice presentation. So I would say mathematically it works beautiful. 
sorry? Mathematically, it works beautiful. Yes. But I, I would ask uh, what is in the background, what kind of objective world is presented by such mathematics? Okay. What uh, kind let, of reality? Let, let me answer yeah. you that with one thing because, well, unfortunately, I did not uh, yet publish it, but I have uh, an experiment which uh, should uh, really uh, verify that. And later we can talk about yeah. that experiment. No, 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 I can I, explain I, you I because believe it, in it, verification. it can be, in can no be experimentally, this idea can be experimentally verified whether it is true or not. Yeah. But there, there is experiment which, uh, which yeah. uh, can no really no. decide up that. I like this Einstein yeah. quotation. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you. So, other <laughs> questions? I know that we will have uh, some other uh, um, lectures concerning the same, the same uh, subject and presented from a, another point of view. So we will have opportunity maybe to, to after those lectures, to confront these ideas. But maybe we can uh, discuss a little bit more. Let me ask a, a kind of conceptual question. So yeah. you said, you, you uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I, so you said at the end, for any experiment, you can choose some reference yes, yes. where everything looks natural. Yes, the, not natural. It looks like in our uh, space-time structure. Uh, if you consider that natural, OK. okay but whatever. Um, there, there's some frame in which in, the, in Gizan's experiment, the two registrations happen at the same space-time point, is what you said. That was not two registrations. Uh, the registration is another thing, because the registration has to do, which I did not touch, I think that, is, that has to do with uh, um, collapse of the wave function registration. And that, that uh, I, I only consider up to the point of registration what happened not at the registration itself. Because uh, that is another point, how it how, uh, uh, comes uh, to the collapse of the wave oh, function. That's another question. The how have happens? Alice's lab and Bob's lab. Yes, yes. If I was understanding correctly, in some representation, in some sense or other, yes. you see those two labs as occupying yes. the yes. same location. That's right, yes. Can you give us some sense of, for example, how the apparatus you have an apparatus over here and an apparatus over here. How they merge, do they, well, in what sense they occupy the same space-time location? Don't they interfere with, I mean, are they piled up on each other? Do, can I talk about the geometry of any of them individually or anything? I mean, how can I recover what I normally think of the way I talk about the experimental situation? Well, you, uh, th that is the thing that you have uh, to, uh, have those, so to say, mathematical unitary transformation which transform you one into, into another. So, uh, of course, this apparatus is one microscopic effect. And as far as I think is that the microscopical system which you are look at, which is quantum system, uh, behaviors up to the moment of uh, reduction of wave function uh, according to quantum mechanics. But you have a very small uh, uh, probability of spontaneous reduction of the wave function, which the probability when it comes into interaction with the apparatus which measures it, now you have to do with the system which has not one particle, but Avogadro number of particles. So the probability of reduction enhances by the factor of 10 to the 23 and so on. And the probability which before to the spontaneous reduction of a, a simple particle which uh, did go along quantum theory to, to reduce now enormously and that is really why the, uh, the reduction uh, of the wave function happens and why we don't see the reduction, spontaneous reduction at the level of indiv individual particles, because that probability is very small at the level of one, one particle, and this is to the time 10 to the 23 at the level of combined system, which is made by interaction of that particle with apparatus. Apparatus also should be described by quantum mechanical uh, means, and that is really now uh, one enormous system. Right, right. No. I, I understood everything you said about reduction, yes. sounds like GRW theory. I'm just trying to understand how to understand what I thought of as two separate laboratories. Yes. Quite separate where I could yeah. manipulate one and manipulate the other in any ways I like. And you told me it, in the appropriate representation, somehow 
they're, they are merged. And I'm just yes. trying to understand but what what's is the uh, physics, what, what, how, how to understand the physics of yeah, this the, the, the What is merged is a, a, a quite, in a way, quite strange, because as much as you have a particle at the same time or two points in the space, so to say, then you must have the same effect on the time axis. So that means that the same moment of time, what, when, what happens, also now uh, did happen, so to say, uh, at two different times in space. Uh, and really some of experiments which are uh, so-called this delayed choice experiment. And so you uh, come to that because you uh, somehow in those quantum experiments, long after uh, something happens, you really uh, influence some physicists say that you influence on past, which I think is not, but I think that uh, uh, you know that, you know. Uh, but I think that uh, really you have something that something really happened in a sense at two different points in time. And uh, now you must combine that with that your question, uh, how to imagine that I cannot give you blueprint an answer, so to say. But what I say is that that follows from the strict following of, uh, of in Hilbert space, unitary transformations of physical laws, and they give that you, in, in uh, uh, that physical law should be after to under those unitary transformations should be invariant, and that means that those systems should be given the same status as other systems. That is my argument, because mathematics tells you that you have unitary transformations which are much more general than normal under unitary transfer, which produce you translations and rotations, you have much more general, and those should be admitted the same status as those which we admit, which are translations and rotations. And you, if you interpret them and look what happened to them, it happens that, what I showed you, that the shape of the wave function in those transformers it looks different, like in uh, those always transforming, it looks the same, only translating and rotated, but uh, you have, can mathematically show you that that looks different. Now you can uh, ask, what does it mean? And that is what <laughs> I, I, I tried to, to suggest, in a sense, what does it mean? So just to introduce some, um, my vision, if I uh, correctly understood, so uh, I think uh, the main problem in quantum mechanics is uh, what happens between two measurements. And Bobian interpretation gives its own uh, way of do it, uh, doing it, because uh, they want to refer as much as possible to the classical picture and uh, associating a trajectory to the intermediate uh, period. Uh, I think uh, in this lecture, it was not a question of what's happening during the reduction of uh, no, no, wave no, function, no, no. but exactly the same problem which Bohmian uh, interpretation wants to do, what is in between. And so in between, in, uh, it's all... Uh, what so uh, excuse yeah. me, what, is my, what was my, uh, in fact, argument is that the quantum theory as a new theory requires new interpretation of space and time. All theories which were new required in the past did do that. And all experiments, they do that, from the Galilean transformation to Lorentz invariance and so on. Whenever you have new physical theory, which uh, changes something in past, you really must also, it happens so, change the notion of space and time. And my argument is that in quantum theory today, the notion of space and time was not changed. It was taken over from the classical notion. Not appropriate change was, was taken. And of course, that is, uh, that is uh, seen most, most uh, seriously that uh, the appropriate notion is not there by the rotation of spin by 2 pi. Because in classical space, rotation by 2 pi of any object is the same object. In quantum, it is not. So that means that it is wrong to take over classical notation to quantum. There is something wrong, something spooky. That example shows you already that, that there is something. You must rotate it by 4 pi to get the same. And no classical object you need rotate to 4 pi to, to get the same thing. So, that's, uh, <laughs> so uh, that tells you mathematics. But now they said it, it is only mathematics. But it was experimentally proven that that is, has, has uh, experimental consequence. So it is not only mathematics. Rotation by 2 pi is different from doing nothing. What is the conclusion that we are living in the, in the 
Hilbert space? Uh, sorry? So what is the conclusion of the story, that we are living in the Hilbert space? Or no, my, my, uh, my conclusion is that you should uh, uh, produce the uh, correct notion of space and time starting from the Hilbert space. And in Hilbert space, really, our space-time is, in a sense, uh, some projection from Hilbert space on our three-dimensional space, in a sense, so to say. <coughs> so like in Plato's cave, you know, yeah. story. <laughs> you know, like Prof. you can do uh, like this all already Plato's story, you know. <laughs> so you claim that uh, the the fact that people want to see all the, the behavior of uh, electrons passing through two uh, slits uh, and two slit experiment, it's uh, wrong to... It is to classical. It is just Procrus bed. You know what Procrus bed? You pull on that all experiments you put on Procrus bed of classical ideas of space and time. And uh, this is just un unnatural explanation in classical uh, of all those experiments. Not natural explanation. You already feel that it's something fishy about that. So, so <laughs> we have other lectures concerning this uh, question, uh, and so I think we'll come back to all these things. But are there some other questions or remarks or objections? Uh. I believe my question is analogous to Mr. Molden's. Uh, one of the slides you claimed that you were able to detect um, the linear combination of the spins of the particle. Uh, excuse me, I did not. So I believe in one of the slides you yeah. claimed that you were able to detect uh, the superposition of the three yes. spin states of the yes. particle. Yes. Well, how is that then possible? I mean, Mr. Tim asked the same question if there is. How is that uh, possible? What? Yes, to, to detect the three spin states simultaneously in one particle? N no, 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 you don't detect simultaneously. You detect it either uh, one detector or second or third. Okay. You detect it always by a single detector. Okay. Uh -huh. Al always a single detector detects it. You don't detect it at the same time three detectors. Okay. Okay. I the you repeat the experiment and then depending on the wave function, it is probability to here, and you detect it always a single detector. But you must repeat many, many experiments to have a statistics. And the statistics give you, okay. uh, give you uh, uh, in fact, uh, by analyzing the statistics, you can obtain that. By a single experiment, you know nothing. Uh, like, like I saw this interference experiment. If you have single experiment, you have just one pot, uh, one point, and you have nothing. You must have many, many experiments repeated, then you, you have interference pattern. Uh, that is, you must repeat under the same conditions many experiments to obtain interference. As the question is not that you can detect them on the tree. This is reductional wave uh, function. No, this is not. This is not what was said. It was uh, after that you detect it on the one. But this is what what happens before the uh, Bovian interpretation wants to say that already before it was in one of that state. This yes. is just the opposite thing. That yes. Are there some? My 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 uh, my uh, uh, that to answer you, uh, uh, my argument is that all the time until it is detected, until it is detected, it is going by all those either two ways or three ways and so on. But now, when it is detected, when detector comes into the play, then your quantum system is not more the quantum system of this one particle or small particle, but your system to be considered is this particle in the interaction with detector. But detector is now a huge macroscopic body which has Avogadro number of particles, 10 to the 23. And now you, I, if you have uh, 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 Penrose also things like that, if you have some that, that the reduction of the wave packet should be some spontaneous, spontaneous reduction. And in this reduction is the probability of that say uh, 10 to the minus five, 15. Then in no way by one particle you can see it in thousand years because probability is so low. But if you have the system of this particle connected with your measuring apparatus, which is the Avogadro number of particles, which is 2 to the 23, then you have, if the probability is 10 to minus 15, you have 10 to the 8 reductions in the second. And that is really what makes you the result of the measurement. Because in the case when you measure, you have to do with the macroscopic system where this uh, 
a small probability of spontaneous reduction increases by the factor of how many particles you have in your measuring, because that is now your system to, to look at. Not your, but until the interaction is, that is all going by Schrodinger equation and no reduction happens. And that is where the, those, uh, th 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 this particle is going simultaneously by three ways, and no reduction happens. After you, those three particles come together, you again obtain the same system, no reduction happens. Because probability for the reduction is very small, 10 to the minus 15. But when you have apparatus, the probability increases by the factor of how many particles you have now in your system. Your system is now a combined system, your particle which you measure, and apparatus. That is now your system. And, and the probability increases by that factor. That means it now becomes certainty, really. And then you see reduction of the, of the wave and function. Professor, that I would even have a question. Yes, uh, just for clarification. So before you said that also apparatus, apparatus has to be described quantum mechanically. Yes. Uh, is it the usual Schrodinger description, or do you have something else in mind for quantum mechanics there? Well, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, of course, uh, uh, you have also to describe it uh, relativistically. Schrodinger is not relativistic. Fine, if so you take the relativistic one. Okay. Uh, the uh, collapse of the wave function, is this part of the theory? Or uh, I, 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 uh, I think it, it can be also to some extent by Schrodinger described. But I don't know what is the, uh, the, the point is, the, the question is, what is the mechanism of the state reduction? That is uh, what I think is the, the question. What is the mechanism? Yeah, the that? I because I described that only just by waving hands. Yes, it, is, it, yes. is not, it is not uh, the exact mathematical description. It is only, only, my argument is only, okay, the probability for that, if the small system is very small, if the big system is very, very big, and that is why measuring makes that. That is my argument. But uh, one should have exact uh, mechanism of that. I don't know that mechanism. Okay, okay that's... Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I, I can understand the idea yes. that fundamentally space-time isn't at all what you're calling classic. Yes. And that somehow emerges. But in, in field theory, you impose the equal time commutation relation. So that's a very fundamental part of your mm -hmm. quantum yeah. mechanics. Yes, focus. yes. And the equal time commutation relations make reference to, to, to uh, <coughs> operators at space like, uh, attached to points at space like separation. Right? I mean, that's what you mean. They yes, yes. If they're, yeah, if yes, they're yes. field operators or yes. indexed to points yes. at space like separation. If you don't have a relativistic space time structure, fundamentally, I don't even understand what that constraint can mean. Uh, which constraint? Equal time commutation relations. Yeah, yes, 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 you, you are right. I mean, you are right. And that is a, exactly why, uh, well, I think that is also probably connected with the problem w with the uh, relativistic quantum theory where you know that there were, on the beginning, very many problems with diverg divergences which came, which were really solved, in a way, solved artificially by removing a infinite... Uh, uh, infinity really removing and now everything uh, works mathematically nice but anyhow even so I nobody yet proved it only proved that each element of this um, uh, uh, how to say in the uh, perturbation. In the perturbation theory, each element is co uh, constant, but nobody did prove that the sum of all elements, th there is no proof yet that. Only they, they, they did show that each element is constant, but there is no proof mathematically that the sum of those perturbation elements is constant. Because already the second element was divergent. O only the first element was convergent in the, in the beginning. And that's why Nobel Prize was... Uh, uh, to those guys for, re for renormalization. And what it is renormalization? It's really one artificial thing. Renormalization really throws out infin infinity because you neglect infinity, which is infinity, and what is left looks like nice and it agrees to this experiment, fortunately. And that is all the argument for the renormalization, really, because that, uh, but that also what it agrees is only up to uh, two or three. Uh, elements in the in the in the perturbation series because they cannot sum all those elements because that's again the problem whether that sum is convergent or not nobody knows that and uh, I mean that is all mathematical problems in that are with that existence on this point like space-time 
uh, which, which, uh, which showed up in all those infinities which come up in mathematics. And that is really the reason why uh, this uh, loop theory was created. Because loop theory was created to, to the avoid the notion of point. To say that particles is not point-like but is, uh, has some, uh, and, and that is uh, then, then you don't have See. infinities. And then uh, infinities are gone and so on. Uh, but then you predict uh, uh, many new particles which never were experimentally found until now. And you, you uh, uh, predict also that uh, that cannot be in four-dimensional our space. It must be something like 12, 14-dimensional space. You predict some really crazy things in order everything to be consistent in, in, in loop theory. Are there some other remarks or objections? So I think we will come so back to... Yes. In one of your slides, yes. maybe in many of your slides, uh, you said that uh, for to explain such and such phenomena, the particle must go in the both directions. Yes, at the same time. Okay. yes. So I would like to ask you, when yes. you say must...